G'day listeners, this episode is proudly brought to you by our major sponsor, supshq.com.au. Use code BENS15 at checkout to receive 15% off on your next purchase. G'day listeners and welcome back to another episode of the Matter Mentality podcast where we talk all things training, nutrition and psychology to optimize your performance. This week we are joined by a good friend and a special guest, I guess you will put it, as a president of a sport that is near and dear to my heart and something I'm very passionate about. We are joined by Big Stu O'Brien. How are we doing, mate? Good, mate. And that's our founder, not president. No one Sorry, voted. Founder. No one voted for me. I'm not an elected <laughs> official. <laughs> it's a dictatorship. There's not yeah. a debate here. It's not a democracy. Yeah. <laughs> not that anyone that calls them a uh, selves a president is a uh, democracy. <laughs> not in our sport. <laughs> oh, we're already off to a flying start. Yeah. Mate, how's things? We're coming up yeah. to a big point in your calendar. How are we doing? Yeah, we're uh, 10 days out from show one, so Ooh, shit. I'm flat out. Yeah. See, I, I always, I base it on my clients, so I'm like, oh, we've got three weeks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've got 10 days. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, for those yeah. that don't know, I guess, and we'll, we'll quickly um, do a bit of a backstory there, is Stu is the founder of NBA, Natural Bodybuilding Australia. Give us a... You actually, no, don't even quick one. Give us the background. Give us the introduction to NBA, what it is, where it came from, why it's different, what makes it unique. Yep. So NBA or Natural Bodybuilding Australia, we're not a basketball uh, place. <laughs> so we've been around for just over five years. So mm-hmm. the, uh, the four of us that started NBA all came from another federation, we were all involved in that with uh, five or more years as well. So, yeah, we um, we essentially, that federation got sold. Mm-hmm. The new owner started steering it in a direction that we didn't like. So we decided to, to jump ship and do our own thing and, and do it better. So, yeah, like that's, that's how... Mate, you can't really. I mean, you can't really argue with that. Once you once you recognise that something isn't aligned with you, right? You, you kind of you either stay there and cop it, and yeah. just keep going with what it is. And you know, a lot of people like to do that. They'll complain about how things are going, but not make any changes. And you guys just decided, actually, you know what? We can do it better than what it's doing. Yeah. So yeah, you know, we definitely tried to keep it in the right direction and mm-hmm. and keep things you know moving. But yeah, it became pretty obvious pretty quickly that that wasn't going to happen. So yeah, we 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 pulled out the life rafts and jumped ship. <laughs> what were the uh, what were the I guess like? I know firsthand the clickness, if that's even a word. The yeah, I guess you could say it called that. The circle nature of bodybuilding and the clicks that that are within the industry in all aspects of federations. What do you guys find was some of the biggest struggles separating getting started? Uh, for us, well, mostly our biggest troubles was the um, the pe- people involved with the old federation actually mm-hmm. spe- spreading lies and talking shit about us, yeah. which in the end most people didn't believe. And, yeah, the proof was in the pudding that, you know, we were doing the right thing and those people weren't. But... Yeah, you know, definitely, um, that was definitely the hardest thing. So, you know, being, so the four of us that started, there was myself and Nick, who you know quite well in Queensland. Who's that? And two, two guys <laughs> in New South Wales who um, were heavily involved down there. Mm-hmm. So essentially a big part of the initial startup was almost more like a rebrand than a yeah. starting from scratch. Yeah. You know, we'd built good networks, we'd built, you know, people yeah. knew we ran good shows. Yeah. We just changed some things for the better and ran even better shows. So yeah, it wasn't wasn't too hard on that side of things. We all had good networks and got got things up and running quickly. It was yeah, just the the dealing with the the back end shit. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, the pettiness of bodybuilding. You gotta love it. Yeah. <laughs> But I guess that's like, yeah. like the the one thing in this industry that I think shows through for a lot of people is that if you're genuinely 
a good person, you, you follow values, you have good morals in the way you operate, whether it be as a coach, as an athlete, as a promoter, as a federation, people tend to see it, even if the bullshit comes up, even if the lies are spread and crap comes up. Generally, if you stick to your your values and your virtues, it tends to it tends to shine through, right? Yeah, no, that's definitely true. So yeah, yeah. And that's yeah, you know, that's what we set NBAA up on. Mm -hmm. Get those words out. <laughs> so yeah, you know, we you know, some of the things we saw going on, you know, judging decisions just being all over the place, non-consistent. Mm -hmm. You know, so straight away. I actually set up a digital judging platform where all the judges actually have a laptop in front of themselves. It's not scribbling notes on a piece of paper and passing mm -hmm. them around. Yep. And within that, not only does it prevent, you know, any dodginess going on, it also helps me see any judge that needs training. So, course, yeah. and, and third fold, it actually speeds up the process. So why wouldn't you want to do it? Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, it's we're the only people who do it still six years later. Yeah, you know, everyone else, every other show I've ever seen in the world is passing pieces of paper around, scribbling notes, and yeah, <laughs> you know, it just it's not professional for a start. Yeah. And leads to potential questions being asked about, you know, how the show's judged. Yeah. That leads it leads to a standardization of the process, right? Like the idea yeah. should be if there's a, like whether the judging is done in here or Western Australia, the same protocol and standard is adhered to so that I know if I've got a client going on stage, we're looking for this taper, we're looking for this proportion and symmetry, we're looking for this level of condition, and it's going to be as respected over there as it is over here and expected over there as it is over here, right? Like it's not going to be, oh, but the judge over here thinks slightly different. It's yeah. it, You're going to have some subjectivity, but there's a guideline pretty standardized to what's wanted. Yeah. And, you know, as far as I'm aware, there's only two federations in the country who work like that. All the others, what they want in one state is different to the next and different to the next. And it just, it, it blows my mind. Like, why, why does the, like, we've got set criteria and set categories. Why is each category looked at differently just because it's sunnier in Queensland and cloudy in Victoria? <laughs> like there's no reason for it, but it happens. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like that's the thing too, right? Body, bodybuilding. We all accept when we play the game, the bodybuilding subjective, whether you're a coach and you have clients, whether you want your clients to do the best, whether you're an athlete yourself and you're still currently competing, we all accept that there is a subjectivity to the game that you just can't beat. But at the same time, you want to get up there knowing that or hoping that there is a subjective but still definitive criteria what's being looked for. Do yeah. I fit that as best I can to make sure I've got my foot best forward to get in the position to win? Yeah. And like these clients pay you a lot of money to be their coach. Mm -hmm. They pay me or the federation a lot of money to enter the show. You know, why change the criteria on the day and say, oh, that person should have done one division, not the one they entered because they thought that was where they suited. Mm -hmm. you know, it's just taking people's money and giving them a bad experience. And then everyone loses. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because like it, it, the, the endeavor should be to bring more positive interactions to bodybuilding as a whole, right? Whether it be yeah. the enhanced route or the natural route, we should be seeking to make sure that people have a positive experience. Not that everyone's going to win because that's just childish yeah. thinking, but yeah. at least in the sense that everyone's given the right opportunity and a fair chance to win and the best chance to win. And they're given, a, I guess, across the day, across the season, the best experience to know, hey, bodybuilding's for me in the future. Yeah, that's it. Like if the people who aren't winning still had a great day and then want to do another prep and come back again, that's a good thing. If the people who aren't winning, whether it's third or last, you know, out of 20 or two, yeah. it doesn't matter. If they're going, well, that was shit. I never want to do that again. Mm -hmm. How's that good for the sport? Yeah, exactly. Like we, you can base your positive feedback on the guy who got first, but he's automatically going to be positive, right? He's automatically, yeah. he's, he's on, he's over the moon. I can tell you firsthand that that puts you over the moon. You could have asked yeah. me anything that day. And I'm giving you positive feedback. I didn't even yeah. care. I was wrapped. Yeah. But show could run five hours late. 
literally you know the lights turn off mid-show if you won you don't care yeah exactly right you know, i'm not i'm not like going back there and being like spitting your face being like no this was terrible i'm yeah. sweet let's go yeah but the the positive comes from if you can get positive feedback from the people who had the neg- most negative likelihood which is losing then you're gonna like you're setting yourself up to have a positive experience for everyone involved right like the the whole day like if you're you know, the entire runtime is is operating properly or at least being notified to people. If coaches are aware of what's happening, we've got, we're aware of any stuff ups or screw ups or like, you know, mishaps or misalignments of time, schedules, whatever. And all that thing's matching up and lining up. Then the coach is having a good time. The clients are having a good time. The whole show is a good time. Everyone's like, hey, you know what? I didn't win, but guess what? I'm going to come back and win next time. I'm going to come back and go harder. Now I know what I'm looking for. Now I know in the future what that's going to look like. Yeah, that's it. And it's like, even, you know, on that, you know, shows running late, that happens quite regularly. Start of the day, you know, take five minutes to judge each division. But the end of the day, because you're running late, start taking two minutes to judge a division and, you know, things, you know, decisions don't get made properly. Like, Mm -hmm. that just gives the people at the end of the day a bad experience. Mm -hmm. Take as long as it needs to be judged. If you're running late, own it, you know. Mm Don't don't rush and fuck things up just because you're running late. I mean, there's about 400 million questions here alone that we could peel out of just judging. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I, I get like in that same instance, that's how I, that's how I approach my coaching. Is if it's if I'm doing a check in day and there's 10 or 15 clients on a day, if I am moody at the end of the day, but I'm positive at the start of the day, I have 10 different clients that have 10 different experiences of me. I should be able to deliver day at the start of day to the end of day, the same person to all those clients so they're having a good experience so that they get me at this positive level the whole time. So if I need to take a break or take away, I can take a minute, take a little bit longer, go for a walk, come back and do the next chunk of clients. It's that same thing with like a show day, right? Like you want to have the start of the day be just as positive as the end of the day so that everyone's like, hey, I'm coming back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's that's how we've looked at it from the start. Yeah, make the people coming last still love their experience. And then you're doing doing things right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, let's let's go into into where we kind of just went there with um, yeah, you know, just just judging judging things like we talked about time there before. Um, yeah. looking at the aspect of like let's say while we're running late, how do we how do we look at because it is becoming quite frequent shows getting too big because yeah. there are you know we're we're seeing like large proportions of of divisions we're seeing uh an exorbitant amount of athletes everyone and anyone can enter and compete which is great to a degree yeah but then you've also got like the same let's say 50 people now doing 14 divisions or, or shows over the day adds a hell of a lot of time and then starts to blow things out and starts to like you know things just get out of proportion they get out of hand yeah. it gets crazy where where do we go with that? Because you can't yeah. say like you know you don't want to tell people, hey, look, screw you, you can't do this many. Like you know you you're not gonna do. You know, I don't want you to come back and do certain shows, but at the same time, there's got to be a a limit, right? Where we say, look, it's it's getting out of hand now. Doing seven or eight divisions on one day, you're probably pushing the line. Yeah, and like as a coach, how how do you peak someone eight times in one day? You pick one. Like, you're picking one's a prime yeah, one, right? Like, exactly. So yeah. so what we do. And, you know, it's one of the things that does separate NBA from the other federations. So everyone mostly fits one category best. You mm-hmm. you know, for guys, your bodybuilding classic or physique, yeah. or in the Natty Feds, we've got fitness as well. Yeah. You know, most people will fit one really well yeah. and then have one either side of it that mm-hmm. they might do okay in. Yeah. So we limit people to doing two categories mm-hmm. you can't do men's fitness men's physique classic physique and bodybuilding in the same show because mm-hmm. they're four entirely different criterias I agree and you can't look how you can you can maybe get two looks in one day yeah but you can't get four different looks in one day and do it well you know? yeah yeah and I- and if you're judging to the criteria properly, there is no way a bodybuilder can put on board shorts and look good in men's physique. Yeah. You know, they shouldn't be able to do it. So why take their money and get them to do it for them to, again, place last, have a bad experience? So yeah, I mean, just 
just don't take their money. Tell them, no, you're a bodybuilder and a classic guy. Do those two divisions and then, you know, stick to that rather than taking their money and saying, just try these other ones because I'll make an extra 500 bucks out of you. You know, I mean, that's, there's five different things to unpack just there, right? We're a yeah. place where we're taking the position of assumption of morality there that someone will say no to money um, yeah. or in the instance, turn down money. Yeah which has not always been the case in bodybuilding. And, you know, on top of that, then you're, you're in the ability to take five divisions or four divisions, whatever it is you want, however many there are nowadays in different federations. Let's say that someone wins somehow across, you know, they compete in bodybuilding, but they also win men's fitness. Don't know how that's possible. You've now taken away from the experience of another athlete or a competitor, the genuinely fit fitness and now yeah. instead of them progressing their career, they're going, screw this. I just got jib. This guy just won this division and this division. So now I'm never coming back because bodybuilding gets stuffed. It's too corrupt or political or it's, you know, too egotistical and self-involved yeah. all because, you know, in that essence of trying to take a few extra bucks from the first competitor, you've now lost five competitors that are pissed off. You got seven guys doing all five divisions, all five categories. Yeah. Yeah. And then like unpacking it that even step further, the, the people in the crowd who don't know these people, confused. Are looking, they're so confused. They're looking yeah. at the same people six, seven, eight times. <laughs> yeah. They're like, screw this. I'm out of here. I've seen it all already. Yeah. You know? And then you end up with no crowd because they've seen it all already. You know? So it just makes no sense, but happens all too much. Yeah. I, I, I guess like it comes back to a point of, are you trying to truly grow your federation and the sport collectively, or are you just trying to make a buck? Yeah. And like, like, yeah, sure. Bodybuilding. We already know bodybuilding is a niche sport. It's a niche, niche interest. We like to see the freaks. We like to see the weird side. We like to see the different yeah. side. We already know that. So it's a bit of a struggle to try and expand that market, but it's ever increasing. It's ever growing. It's like any sport that's trying to take off. Right. Yeah. But if we become too self-centered and self-absorbed in our growth, you're going to limit that growth and eventually actually probably cannibalize it and lose. Yeah. Oh, and I, and that's generally what's happening now. You know, the average life of a competitor is about two and a half years. You know, Which is so most, disheartening. Yeah. Like I've been in the sport 15 years, roughly now. I stopped counting a while ago and, <laughs> and I could literally count on one hand the number of people in Australia that I know that were involved in the sport when I first started. You know, Is that from like, a competitive perspective or originally, like, I guess, more of like a promoter or coach well, yeah. perspective? Even, even promoters, competitors, like, you know, one head's probably a slight exaggeration, but it'd be less than 20 in the entire country yeah. that are still around 20 years ago that were involved in any format 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. which which is kind of indicative of how deep the problem lies hey like yeah. as, a, as a business if we look at bodybuilding as a business yeah everyone like there's always this constant need or feel to attack each other and and kind of like take from the same piece of the pie not realizing that there's plenty of pie yeah. instead of realizing that we're trying to bring more people in by everyone having a positive experience having the best experience having a fair shot but also being constructive in the way like hey you know what you didn't win this time come back there's more to this in the future. If you have a shit experience, most people are only making true gains after two to three years anyway. Yeah. Like you're two years into competing and you've only just started training anyway and you're losing interest. That's that's where you're really only going to start making those first few gains, let alone now you're stopping. Like yeah. we're, we're, we're eating away at the potential pool by just being so self-absorbed and like a narcissistic in a way about our federation or this federation or yeah. you know whoever we are as a federation trying to make the extra buck. Yeah. That's it. And it's, yeah, it it literally is cannibalizing yourself for a short-term quicker, you know, quicker fix. So we've got, we've got basically the, well, the NBA approach to limit competitors. Have you had anyone kick back from that? I can't imagine there would um, be. I, occasionally, and it's generally, you know, Bikini girls ask me if I like money. You know, don't you like money? Why don't you want us to do that? But as soon as I actually say, look, this is why, mm -hmm. no one goes, oh, well, that's dumb. They all go, yeah. oh, yeah, oh, yeah. That, that makes sense. 
you know, <laughs> the initial, like almost every show I get someone saying, why can't I do more? You know, yeah. But yeah, when you explain it to them, they go, oh yeah, shit. Yeah, that's the answers I get. So, you know, it's, there's, there's never been any single person pushback with a legitimate argument as to why you should allow people to do more. Because the thing is too, like, because once we break down categories, like you, you aren't, it's, it's not limiting money. It's being logical. You're limiting categories. So logically for the logistics and the criteria, the ethics, excuse me, of the business, of the, of the coaching, judging, you probably shouldn't look this, like look the criteria in fitness as you should bodybuilding. So that makes sense. But it's not that you can't do more, divi- like can't get more t- time on stage. Your division, like I've got first timers. I've got guys who've never competed before. There's novice, there's intermediate, there's first timers, there's open division, all inside yeah. that category. You've yeah. got plenty of chances to be on stage. Yeah. You should be pretty clear and your coach should be pretty clear by stage day what categories you best suit so it's not even an issue. Yeah. We do also limit it to two divisions within that category. So even that, better. Yeah. So again, when you get to the overall, you don't go and have one person who's, you know, fits nine of the 11 categories, who's won nine of the 11. <laughs> yeah. And, and one other person who fit the other two, who they probably beat in one of those nine yeah. up on stage. And it's not a competition. Like this yeah. sport is actually a competition. Yeah. You know? So we want the overall, you know, at the end of the day, the pinnacle to yeah. be an actual competition. Crazy. You know? So, yeah, mind-blowing thought that, I know. But, yeah, so but we do even, again. Like, even, like, let's say, um, you know, let's say I'm a bikini girl and I also want to try out an optional division. You know, I've got sports, I've got fitness, I've got uh, wellness now is, is taking off, um, whether, whatever federation it may be. I, I can tell you firsthand, I am an IFBB enhanced competitor. So I've done classic and I've done open bodybuilding on the same day in the same, like the, uh, I've done novice and opens. I've done first timers and opens. There is no way you have the energy and the fuel and the, the desire to do that many divisions anyway. Like you get so tired so quickly, like the, the, the drop in insulin that I had and not even in a sense of like, Oh, I've got to go stab some insulin. Literally just the drop in like my blood sugar levels and my energy for the day. I tanked after states where I did four divisions. I got in the car and fell asleep. Like I passed out. I don't know how anyone wants to do more than that. And that's not even a love of not being on stage. I love it. But like at a certain point, you're just being silly to yourself. If you think you're going to do five, six, seven divisions in a day. Yeah. I still, the, the last time I competed, yes, I am old, was a bit more than 10 years ago. There... There wasn't classic. There was just bodybuilding for mm-hmm. guys. And bodybuilding and physique, I think, was around then. Girls literally was figure. Yeah. And I won my category and did the overall. I was a thousand times more wrecked by doing two in one day mm-hmm. than I was from doing one. Yeah. Like I can't imagine getting on stage three or four times even, let alone eight. Yeah. It, it just gets silly because it, like, especially if you're like, if we map this out from a coach's perspective, we're looking at, okay, if you're doing well, like say, say you're picking these divisions because you, you truly want to win. It's a competition. That's what you're there for. Not just the whole experience shit. We'll go into that in a minute. Yeah. But from the sense of being a coach doing like five, six divisions, especially naturally the fatigue you develop from that, you then have to go back next week. Like let's say it's a state show or a state title or even like a, a regional title. You then have to go, okay, I'm also wanting to do nationals or I'm also wanting to do the next state or the state one or the bigger one. You might have a week or two weeks, whatever it is. Like the fatigue you're building in that show, doing eight times on stage or seven times, whatever it is, maybe you make overalls a couple of times so there's some, some double ups. You then have to get off stage, deplete everything, be tired from that entire day, deal with the adrenaline dump deal with all the fatigue and the energy that you've just dumped in yourself. And now you've got to try and reload and get ready to go again in two weeks time. Like as a coach, you've also got to look at that and go, is this worth 21 times on stage to go to nationals afterwards? Like probably not. Yeah. 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 Four max. Yeah. 
Like, and yeah. then maybe like you know some of the girls do a fun division like theme wear or you know something like that for some extra stage time. Mm -hmm. But four legitimate categories that yeah. you need to pump up for and peak for should yeah. be the maximum you want to do. And I, I can say, like, as a coach, we go on stage knowing full well what the primary division is our clients going for. Like, you're, you're, you've predetermined, like, okay, we're aiming to do like our best chance here. What we really want to exceed in is probably going to be X division. So we'll peak for that one properly. We'll probably just do a quick pump up for this one, but I don't want to drive glycogen spent before that. So we'll we'll fuel for that one, and you'll just enjoy these ones. Cool. Yeah. Like we know. So you're trying, like, if you've got a client up there and you're over-pumping them five, six, seven times, by the time they get to the true division they want to win, if you're trying to pump up every single, like, you're, 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 you're potentially ruining their chance and their experience. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, yeah, people do fade throughout the day. So you're yeah, doing too much. Yeah, 100%. But, I mean, yeah, like we, we, we take that back then, I guess, um, you know, we we're, we're talking previously about, you know, more divisions. Like, is there then an issue with not enough divisions? Yeah. Well, yeah. Some, like, and in the natty world, yeah, in most cases, there's too many divisions, I would say. Not enough. <laughs> yeah. They're, yeah, enough to too many. Yeah. yeah. Like, our... Our nationals is a two-day show mm -hmm. because over the course of the two days, including pro and amateur divisions, there's 110 divisions for the two two-day show. Yeah, that's fair. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah, you, there there is no way, even at five minutes a division, you can run that in a one day. No, go so, on. Yeah, it's it just is what it is. Yeah, but yeah, that's yeah. 10 different categories between mm -hmm. the guys and girls, roughly 10 categories, 10 divisions per category. You know, that's fine. You know, in the guys, guys, we've got men's fitness, men's physique, classic physique, bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. You know, in the natural world, there's not, there is separation between all those divisions. Mm -hmm. You know, for the girls, we've got swimsuit, bikini, sports model, fitness, figure international, figure, and wellness now. Mm -hmm. So seven different categories there. Mm -hmm. you know, wellness is just starting, so there's not a lot of cat extra divisions. It's run as a, its own thing. Mm -hmm. but, um, you know, so each of those, again, 10 different divisions between that adds up very quickly. Yeah. So, you know, it's... But you know, then you get some federations who want to run bikini straight through to figure and not have anything in between. And there is a big jump in the physique. Yeah. That you know, if you don't fit the bikini criteria, you've got to do a whole lot of growing before you fit the figure criteria. Like yeah. Even IFBB has wellness in between. Yeah. You know, there's yeah, and there's a lot of growing from bikini to wellness, let oh, alone God, yeah. to figure. So yeah, that's the other side is shows that try and just cut everything out to to almost be like six categories, no, you know, five divisions per category. You're again not going to have the best experience because you're not half the competitors out there won't fit one of the categories. You know, they'll yeah. be more suited to a category that isn't even running that show. Which I guess then again kind of hinders your your chances as a business federation yeah. in that you're not like, and, and I, I always get like, what well, you know, I hate the idea of accommodating to everyone at all times. It's, that's never feasible. But like you are definitely shooting yourself in the foot by not having those options available. I guess it's finding that unique balance between not being over the top and just trying to make money, but also yeah. like, if you have an awesome federation potential or you have the potential to grow a good federation, making sure that it's got the potential chance for people to do what they need to do or be in the division that gives them the best chance to win. Yeah. Yeah. Gives them the best chance to win, the best chance to have a good experience on show day. Yeah. They're not entering the show because they've heard this federation's amazing. They're new in the, the country. They're doing amazing things. And I want to do their show because they sound cool, but there's actually no category for me. So... 
I'll do a category I'm not suited to have a bad experience on show day because I'm going to be the girl or guy left in the back corner yeah. not actually looked at. Like, yeah. Why waste your money if you don't suit the categories that are on offer? Yeah, mm. for sure. Like, I, I guess that like that leads to an interesting question, I guess, like in the sense from promoting a federation, growing a federation, promoting shows, is how much is the show put on for the athlete? How much is the show? And this is not even like a, you need to defend yourself here, but more so like we as athletes, as coaches, you guys as promoters, as a federation, like there is a, there is a, and I think people get it wrong when they don't understand that there is still a degree where it's promoting a business or promoting a show is to draw people in crowds to come in, to put bums on seats, to watch something. We also want to make sure that our athletes have a good time. You guys also want to make sure the athletes are having a great experience. Like there's obviously that balance for you guys as the federation to make sure both are occurring, right? Yeah. 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 When we any decisions from the day we started still stay now and till the day I stop being involved, any changes in how we run things, any decision about categories, divisions, judging, anything at all, the first criteria make that is it has to be beneficial to the sport first. Mm -hmm. Then it also has to be beneficial to making money. You know, but if it's not beneficial to the sport and it makes money, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. You know, so you know, just because it's going to you know add an extra five grand, we'll call it, into our pocket per show. You know, but actually long term, it'll cannibalize the sport. I'll say we'll say no, not doing that doesn't make sense long term. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll do it this way that is actually better for the sport. That's great for like the vision of bodybuilding as a whole, right? Like you're looking long term at the growth of the industry, the growth of the sport, not just the growth of my wallet here and now. Like yeah. where is it? Where is it? Like, you know, how do we see shows run in the future or, you know are we seeing athletes get bigger so we need to be more prepared for more food or you know do they need to, more time to pump up or like things like that just little micro details that as a coach or an athlete you go i appreciate that consideration it doesn't seem like much but as long as like we're heading in this direction you guys putting that step forward for the athlete and the coach is i guarantee a lot more rece uh, well received yeah yeah like wellness is actually a really good example of that so you know, wellness category, you know, started in IFBB or mm -hmm. the old IFBB that's not even really relevant in Australia anymore <laughs> and started in the, you know, European countries, Brazil, yeah. et cetera, because people in those countries genetically have bigger bottom halves than top halves. Yeah. Yeah. That's where the category came from, you know, there are some federations in the natural world who look at bikini, uh, sorry, wellness as, to put it nicely, the girls who couldn't even get lean enough for bikini category. Yeah. So they're disproportionate because they're still quite soft. Yeah. You know, there's more of those girls than natural girls <laughs> that are disproportionate because of muscle. Yeah. So the category is going to grow quicker and make more money because there's more of those people around. Yeah. But what's the what's actually good for the sport? What's what's the sport about? It's you know, it's about dieting, growing muscle, all of those things. So if that disproportion is that not muscle, are you really a wellness athlete? Yeah, we've uh, just got another five weeks in and you didn't actually diet for. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we when no, you know wellness one we're gonna just say that you have to do sports or fitness to be able to do wellness mm -hmm. so we're gonna get girls with enough muscle for the category because they're yep. gonna suit one of those two yeah and you have to be lean enough that the disproportion is obviously muscle not fat yeah yeah so yeah that criteria to spell out this is what the category would be you know our wellness, you know, I've had three to five girls in the category most times because there's a lot less girls out there that meet that criteria. Yeah, of course. You know, is it the right criteria? Yes. Is it what's best for the sport long term? Yes. Yeah. You know, does it make me more money or the federation more money? No. 
but we you know, we went with the one who that's better for the sport, not the one that makes more money. Yeah. But again, like it sets you guys up and, you know, hopefully, you know, conversations like this will set other federations up to look at it from that holistic long-term perspective yeah. that you're not just, we're not just, we're not just encouraging qu- like quantity on stage. We're encouraging quality at the end yeah. of the day. And, and like, you know, this is again, I think uh, um, something I want to touch on from all of bodybuilding is that I think this endeavor that experience is, the idea of experiencing bodybuilding has become this novel excitement cliche thing that everyone on Instagram wants to do. So it leads to not sub quality, but you know, like anyone thinking they've dropped 20 pounds is therefore a bodybuilder and should get on stage. And therefore they have to fit into some of the category. They have to fit somewhere because they've registered and they've paid, but you know, in the interest of the sport and in the interest of, you know, these divisions having specific criteria, it's not necessarily the best thing because we're saying that, hey, this is open to everyone. But the fact is, not everyone's a bodybuilder. Not everyone's a bikini <laughs> chick or a physique chick. Like they're just, you're just not. Yeah. No, that's, and it takes a lot of work to be good in any of the, you know, your structure basically determines which category you're going to mm-hmm. suit best. The amount of work you do then determines how well you're going to do in that category. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yes, there's a structure for every, a category for everyone structurally, but if you don't do enough work to meet the other criteria of condition, muscle mass, et cetera, then you're going to look out of place. Yeah. And that, yeah. that, that in of itself, again, is I think a problem that people miss from all walks of bodybuilding. Like I've, I've heard these conversations in every, in every federation, in every division, they'll they'll pick the one thing that they think they do well or they think they have going for them and neglect the rest of the criteria to which they don't suit and be like oh you know but i should have won or you know I've, I, I lost body fat i lost this much fat i would had thick legs but okay but did you have conditioned legs did you have proportional legs and waist ratio to your bum and to your shoulders did you have you know x amount of taper or x frame did you have you know good posing all the things that contribute to the overall criteria of being judged it's like people don't really comprehend the the way in which all scores are scored. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, we can go on a judging tangent now because it's probably a good time. Yeah, we look at judging as the best. Yeah, you know, there is muscularity, conditioning, symmetry, mm-hmm. and presentation are the four main criteria. Mm-hmm. For, for, you know, it's the best combination of all of them. Yeah, you can't be amazing at one and terrible at three. Yes, and still win. Like you've got to, you know. And there's no one that is more important than the others. Mm-hmm. You know, there is is equal. You know, but you also then don't go and go. Well, these four categories are worth twenty five percent each. Yeah, I'll give you half a point. Or, you know, a quarter of a point for each, because that then just becomes too technical and it take the day too long to judge. Yeah, of course. You know, as a judge sitting there, you're going, this person is the closest to the criteria and the best combination of all of those. Yeah. Okay. So people that try to overcomplicate that or try and focus on any one area of that are not getting it right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's important to understand too is like, is the fact that the criteria and that judging is what we're looking for. It's what you're aiming for. It's what you're trying to achieve. Like just going, I lost some weight, therefore I'm going this division. Or, you know, I have a tight waist, so I'm going to do bikini. Or, you know, I don't want to train my legs, so I'm going to do physique or, or fitness, What you know, the, yeah. given the divisions that you guys have as naturals. But when we blow that up, even the enhanced route, like, yeah, great. Just because you don't train your legs doesn't mean you proportionally have good shoulders or a tight weight, a tight waist and tight taper. There's guys with smaller shoulders, shoulders than you, but a much better taper that will win physique. Because yeah. you don't understand how the judging works. You just think that my friend's dad's uncle told me I look good and I should do a show. Yeah. And anyone who says a physique competitor doesn't train legs hasn't seen a good physique competitor. Because yeah. we we still look at the shape of the leg. Like, yeah, we can't see the condition through shorts, but yeah. the shape yeah. still matters for their total symmetry. Yeah. So you still need muscle on those legs in men's physique and even men's fitness. Yeah. Like, it's proportionate to the category, but 
you don't want two sticks on a massive upper body in any yeah. category. Like symmetry is as important a factor as muscularity, you know, and whether you put shorts on or not, if you've got really small legs, your symmetry will be out. Yeah. Right? And then again, it's like, it comes down to uh, also, I think is the coach understanding it's the proportional percentages, I guess, not so much the percentage, but the proportional representation of that criteria. Like you're not expecting the physique guy to have bodybuilding legs. What you're expecting is that the physique guy has the proportional relation of symmetry to the upper body in a way that doesn't make it look stupid. Yeah. That's, that's the perfect way to explain it. It just, yeah. It, like, again, <laughs> I think a lot of people don't don't really, and this is where I think the the noviceness and the 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 excitability of just wanting an experience to get on stage. You haven't gone in the, on stage with the competition rules in mind. You've just gone, oh, I've dropped some body fat. I'm leaner. I look good in a bikini, or my girlfriend's telling me I look good in a bikini. Then you have a shit time because you've set yourself up with this false expectation of doing well or winning, or you know you suit a division. Reality is you're just still fat or, you know, you're still soft or you're just actually not a bodybuilder or a bikini chick. Like you're just not meant to be there. But yeah. by not knowing those rules or those those expectations, those criteria, the judging uh, descriptions, you set yourself up to have a shit time. Yeah. 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 And they're the ones we can't control. Like Exactly. If someone, yeah. If someone has a shit time because they did those things, that's totally out of our control as a federation. Like, oh, 100%. We and want think, every competitor to have a good time. Yeah. But if, you know, if they don't do the work in getting the right knowledge, then, you know, we put everything out there to help them make the right yeah, decisions. You know, I'm constantly getting messages from coaches and competitors saying, what can I fit in to, you know, those sort of things. Yeah. You know, so we put everything out there for people to get it right. If they choose not to use those tools and then still don't get it right, then I'm sorry, we tried. Yeah, like, even even things like 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 workshops. Yeah. The perfect time to ask and find out, fuck around and find out, literally figure it out, is attend these workshops and see where do I stack up? Am I gonna be lean enough for that division? Or do I suit this division? Can I have fun in this division? Even if I'm not gonna go in there and dominate, am I at least going to proportionally have fun in this division? Be looked at because I've put in the work and I suit being there. And not just because my coach told me to go do it or this person told me to go do it or this, you know, uh, a sponsor or a promoter said, hey, go do it. Do you actually belong in that division? Should you actually be there? Easy way to find out is go to things like workshops. Yeah, that's it. Go to workshops, you know, go to posing classes, get a coach who actually knows what they're doing mm -hmm. you know, and has runs on the board, you know, and then you'll have a good experience as far as being ready and being in the right categories. Do you guys find like, you know, this is getting a bit more of the, just the the nuance of random uh, competitors, if you will. The, like one of the things that I really struggle with, and I, I always prefer to turn down money. I'll always prefer to push a client away for at least another 12 months, like work with them, but say, hey, you're not getting on stage with me for this period of time because I'll come with this, this high inflated sense of ego, you know, mom, mom and dad and uncle and auntie are blowing smoke about, Hey, you know, you're looking great. You've lost some weight. You're the most lean person in the gym or you're the biggest person in the gym or, you know, around our neck of the woods, you're, you're the fittest looking person we, we see. And they'll come to a show with that inflated sense of like entitlement and victory. And the reality is next to the people who've actually dug in and gone fucking hard, like they're yeah. miles away. And then comes the, it's judging, it's politics, it's this, it's everyone else's fault, it's the coach sucked. It's like, do you guys find many of those? Is it like, have you seen like the backstage abruptions and emotions where that sort of like carried on? Yep. Because we're so good at putting all the info out before the show and, and helping people pick the right categories, it happens a whole lot less at our shows than yeah. I've seen. Yeah. Does it happen? Yes. You know, but it doesn't happen too often because yeah. you know, we're running lots of workshops. Yeah. I'm accessible. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, if someone comes to me six weeks out that looks like they shouldn't be on stage, you know, I won't, you know, tear pieces. Yeah. But I'll tell them honestly, you know, maybe you that off to next season. Yeah. You know, those sort of, you know, I've had that conversation many times. Yeah. I think that's a respectable way to do it too. It's just, you know, 
the, the potential's there, but maybe you started late. Maybe it's not for you. Maybe you just, yeah. you know, something didn't work or click. Um, but it also, I think having that limitation of the amount of divisions you can do means you have to be more specific and very picky as to what one's worth doing, right? Like, yeah. you know, you're not going to set the day up on a negative foot because you're like, hey, I know that I only have these four. I've picked the best four that I think I have a chance in, but also I belong in. And, or, you know, the best two or the best three, whatever it is you picked. Yeah. And now you're actually like, I'm here to see how I stack up, competitively compete, and also hopefully walk away with a win. But if I don't, like, it's not because X, Y, Z, judging this and politics, that, and blah, blah. Like, you've, you've picked your best foot forward. You've picked your best three or best four divisions or best two divisions. Like, that's it. You put the best chance available forward. And yeah. so I guess that kind of limits that as well as a, a, like, and as a way to control that. Yeah. No, that's, that's definitely it. I like it. I like it. It's, it's, it's refreshing to see. I think, um, I think bodybuilding as a whole needs um, not rejuvenation, but just more social awareness and understanding, more availability, but also like more ethics involved. The system has to be better regulated and better controlled in the sense of, you know, like you said, criteria is how we're rewarding people, what we're encouraging. We're not just here to take money, because if we as coaches put forward to a federation and that federation is simply, well, you know, hey, we're going to take all this cash off you, but you get nothing for it. There's no experience. There's no value. There's no vibe. You're not having a good day. You know, everything just, just feels like it's shit and like run poorly or just not even explain properly. Well, now we look like bad coaches. The yeah. industry looks like it's a piece of shit. The sport looks like it's terribly organized or has nothing going on for it. And eventually the client's just going to say, that's not for me. Yeah. That's it. And yeah, you know, who wins out of that? Name one person in the whole chain that wins out of that happening. You know, exactly. No like, yeah. Exactly. We're, yeah. we're all trying to eat, but at the same time, like it's not even just about the money. It's about like if you truly love bodybuilding, you want it to succeed at all levels, at all ranks. Yeah. Like yeah. for my like the way I look at my natty guys, the way I look at my enhanced guys, I will always encourage someone who's pushed and pushed about being enhanced to go the natty route first to ensure that they love the process and the journey for what it is before they even talk about things like that. Yeah. So if I know that they're going to a solid natural federation, have a good experience and the only factor there that they don't like it is that, uh, sorry, is themselves. Well, then I know that they don't need to use subs. They're like bodybuilding might not be for them. Yeah. But at the same time, then I know also if they've gone through it all, they've loved it. They loved every minute of it. The battles, the challenges, the, you know, the call outs, not getting call outs, backstage is a good time. They've had a great run the entire time. We're not going to have some negative post-show experiences. Well, then I know from here, okay, we can step out of the natural ranks and look at, do we go to the enhanced routes with a positive experience, a positive perspective of bodybuilding as a whole, as a sport? Yeah, 100%. Like, and that's like, I often joke, joke's probably the best way to put it, Organizing a comp is like order, organizing a wedding for 150 brides at the same day. Oh, you know, male and female brides. You know, everyone's, you know, and they're all bridezillas too. Yep. But yeah, you know, so I'm trying to make sure 100, 150 people are all having a great day and yep. it's their day. They're also all doing it for different reasons. Like, oh, 100%. You as a coach, only want winners. You know, you're a winner. You only want winners. Yeah. There are some people who want the experience of just getting up under the under the lights. You know, they know they're not going to win, but they want to get up there and just say, "I did it." Yeah, for sure. And that's okay too. Those yeah. are completely okay. Like to clarify yeah. my perspective, I guess for anyone listening, thinking that's what, not what I'm about. Yeah. If if you go there knowing that. I'm all for it, yeah. provided yeah. you're prepared for the rebound, the post phase, understand yeah. you didn't win because of like, you know, you just simply weren't three, four, five percent body fat. If you're aware of that and you still wish to do it, power to you. Yeah. And those people then, you know, again, get the experience, go, geez, I had an amazing day. Now I want to put the work in and, and be yeah. a winner next time. Or yeah. I don't need to do it again, but I had a great yeah. experience. Yeah. And that's it. Tell their friends that it was a great experience. It didn't, you know, didn't wasn't a waste of money. It was a great time. They, you know, and their friends might try it too. You know, so brings yeah, more positive yeah. light to the sport, and everyone has a better time for it, right? Yeah, that's it. So yeah, you do have to be mindful that those people on that experience journey do still have a good experience, and don't, don't just get left in a corner and forgotten about. Yeah. You know, 
So yeah, that's as, as a business, yeah. like knowing knowing full well, right? You, you're you're trying to accommodate to not the lowest person because that's like the wrong way to word it, but the the person who could potentially have the worst experience, you want them to be considered as well because yeah. that's the person that if you give them a good experience, they're the one to go, holy shit, this was so better than I thought. Yeah, and that's it. And and they may be the one who then spends five years and comes back and blows everyone Except away and ass. kicks everyone's ass and gets a pro car. Yeah. And, you know, but like if, if they, had a, they do. Yeah, if they had a terrible experience, they go going to KFC on the way home, stopping at wherever for an ice cream after that and and never stepping in the gym again. Yeah. I might be slightly exaggerating, but you know what I, I mean? I don't um, think it is though. I think it's 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 a bit of a responsibility I think that we have in that especially the novices, the first timers, those like those real tender competitors where you know bodybuilding to me is ingrained in my fucking skin. Like yeah. you could punch me in the face while I'm competing and I'd probably still come back because I'm now going to punch you back when I see you again. Yeah. But the average person, right? The the the, the first time as a novice is they're in that tender nurturing position where, you know, it, not only if they have a bad time at at the show, does that reflect the federation or the show itself or the sport, but it also could then reflect gym culture, gym environments, what it's like to be around other trained individuals, the egos of kids, the egos of you know, immature adults who are just narcissistic, and yeah. they may never go back in the gym again. They may never step there and try again. So there is that degree of responsibility of we have to be understanding that that as a competitor or as a federation or as a sport, it's not just how you went on show day that the experience they had, it could potentially hinder their experience of coming back to the gym or being in the culture in general. Yeah, hundred percent. And I have heard of people not training for months after a show because they had a bad experience. Which is just fucking sad. Yeah. All right. So I'm quickly going to interject the issue. I've got something that we should probably touch on. I think it's a bit of an elephant in the room uh, with new and upcoming federations and and brands that are coming out. I don't want this to come across like it's uh, about the coaches. I think if you play inside the rule book, it's fine. It's the rules that should be clarified, or the 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 um, the criteria, the the structure should be clarified. But what is NBA's policy on coaching on the judging panel? So yeah, straight up can't do it. So probably yeah. a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I agree. Nothing against the coaches that get us to do it and want to help mm-hmm. out. And, and we love up, bodybuilding. It's probably going to happen. Yeah. yeah. So you end up stuck in a, you know, between a rock and a hard place, but yeah, you know, it's not, not beneficial to anyone, competitors, the coaches themselves, the federation for a coach to judge their own clients. So we actually have a, like, I have some coaches who have clients that do judge for me, but yep. whenever that happens, we've got a declaration that they sign before the show, which says any potential biases that they would have, and they step off the table, not just don't judge the division, they actually leave the table for right, any right. division their clients are on. So... Yeah, you know, and generally, if someone's got more than two or three clients, I won't have them on the panel at all in the show yeah. because, yeah, you know, that's just too much chopping and changing them jumping yeah. off the table. But yeah, because you want to have you want to have a like like let's say that happens, you've got three or four coaches that have two or three clients every every uh, over the day. That's twelve times that you're changing co- uh, the judging criteria, right? Because everyone's yeah. subjective. Those are there's a criteria. It's subjective, and, and you end up with twelve times across the day where the, the judging panels changed, which is a lot. Yeah, that's if the clients only did one division. That exactly, yeah. That's if they're all doing three or four divisions. It could yeah. be four times. So you know, it's yeah, it just doesn't work for you know the integrity of the whole show. So. So yeah. I think if you if we look at it like objectively, it like me as a coach, I would feel like if like let's say they win and my clients the like clear winner, cream of the crop, no questions about it, no one's debating it. There's going to be an underlying sense of debate as to whether or not they should have won, yeah, or whether or not there was like a, a, a panel wide bias of like, hey, that's my client. Yeah. Not saying that's what happens. Not saying that is what has happened, but. Yeah. People have their rights to an opinion. People are going to make their opinions by at least not being on the panel or clarifying that you shouldn't be. 
it removes that from the conversation regardless. Yeah, yeah. In the end, in these sort of things, perception becomes reality. Yeah. So if you perceive that there could be a bias, there is a potential that there could be a bias. Yeah. So we won't let that happen. So not only don't we allow coaches to judge their own clients, I won't allow someone to judge their own partner or family yep. member either. So essentially, if there's a financial or physical relationship, yep. then you can't judge that person. Because again, I, I, I believe if you go, if you don't mind me heading down that route, you and your partner were both, uh, you know, we know she made that very clear statement on one of her um, socials one day. She said, I won't be on the panel for X, Y, Z reasons. Yeah. And I remember, I remember reading that and thinking that's a, a hell of an ethical statement to put forward because it just, it just clarifies that you don't, you guys aren't wanting that to be either perceived or, or, you know, understood or or taken the wrong way and so um you know she's just come out and said look we're not going to do this it's just not how i'm not going to do it i won't be a part of it yeah so alicia herself didn't compete with nba because that was right sorry yeah correct even if i stepped off the panel someone is going to perceive that potentially something dodgy could happen you know and the eyes are going to be all over it and Yeah. yeah so she made the decision herself i didn't even have to you know, to push that one. But yeah, she made the decision herself that for the other people that she would have been standing next to, for them to have the best day possible, she shouldn't be standing next to them. Yeah. I so, mean, and it 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 stands to reason that it would tarnish the brand as well. Like if you, like, let's say, and again, we know people can be very emotional and heightened and aroused and worked up on the show day. Let's say that happens. And what, again, someone did blatantly, like just absolutely one, it was not even a question, but then you start to get the perception of, oh, you know, there's a bias. These judges have been cho- like chose X, Y, Z because the coach is on the panel. Well, then now you've got two, three, four, five, ten 10 clients or, or competitors on stage that have heard that. Now they're pissed off. Now they're telling their yeah. friends. Now they're telling their coaches, guess who's getting pulled from competing in that divisional federation again. Yeah, now you're just, exactly. or, or not getting on the, you know, they're just amplifying the bias opinion that people have of the subjectivity of the sport. Well, now you're just amplifying that. And now what was one person's bad day might now be 10 or 20 future competitors that don't come to the sport. Yeah. 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 And I've like, I've seen other federations who do allow it. I've seen other federations who did allow it, follow suit and, and stop doing it. I've sat directly behind the judges panel when a coach was on the panel, watched the whole show very closely there was nothing that I would have seen myself as being potentially a dodgy decision. But after the show, people ask questions. Oh, yeah. that coach was on the panel. What's going on? Yeah. So the perception is that something happened, whether it did or not. Yeah. So why put yourself and your clients or your federation in that position? Yeah. yeah. So the federations themselves who allow it need to be questioned what their motives of integrity in allowing it is yeah you know, why are they doing that you know, yeah like coaches that get asked and dragged in and you know and are doing it because they want to help and they love the sport you know totally get it but yeah the federation themselves why they're allowing it i don't know and i don't get it i, I can't imagine where that short of lovers of bodybuilding and judging that you start drawing from the crowd of coaches. I can't imagine it's that short a supply. Yeah, it's it's not that short. Like I've managed to do it. Yeah, yeah. You know, I fly people into state if I have to to fill a panel out. Yeah, you know, some people don't want to spend that money, so that can be part of it. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. You know, there's there are more than enough people out there that if you want to put the training and the time into helping them be good judges yeah they could do it yeah i mean so, you yeah. you think about like from the athlete's perspective as a coach i'd be more concerned that like let's say i've got a killer client and he stepped on stage and dominated just absolutely killed it female even she's killed it absolutely slayed it but my being on the panel now undermines her win or his win and people are like you know attacking them saying it was only because xyz judge or xyz coach and I just feel like now I've done a disservice to my client. Now they feel like that, you know, you got gold, but it's like, it feels like it was a silver or a bronze. It feels like it was like, it doesn't feel like it was a gold. 
because you know this like this is what's being said so even from the coaching perspective of your client i'd feel worried that that would be perceived that way and i'm taken away from the experience they had because now it's like well did i actually win even if it's in the like you know just that slight doubt would take away from that experience yeah and that's it and it's that slight doubt that perception of anyone and everyone in the whole picture creates a problem that doesn't need to be there yeah and creates a potential bad experience for competitors that just doesn't need to be there yeah yeah it's, yeah agreed and I, I think it's something that i mean again we need to look at growing the sport as a whole and what's in the best interest of the sport because if we are struggling for coaches by the sport growing and allowing people to be interested and be invested in the outcomes and, and looking at the overall objectivity as well as the subjectivity even if you don't want to be a competitor you can be involved with the judging you can be involved in the coaching you can be involved in all these different aspects so i mean if we're that struggled for for judges which we know we're not that the point we're picking coaches well let's do things to grow the sport to have more people interested in judging and in, in yeah. being there on the day and looking and, and paying attention and picking apart the criteria. i'd love to be on a female judging panel i'd love to be on like you know by yeah. growing the sport entirely we then reduce all these problems that people have by seeing the sport but if we feed into those problems, it's going to hinder that growth. Yeah. And that's where, like, sometimes what you said there, I sometimes have a coach that's only got male clients and I'll yep. get them to judge the female part of the show and then vice versa, a coach that's only got female judges, I might get them to judge the male part of the show. Yeah. So that becomes, that's the sort of time where I will have a coach on the panel. It's controlling yeah. for the bias. Yeah. And there are some, you know, most good coaches have a good eye for the criteria and what they, you know, what we're looking for. Yeah. So a coach can make a good judge yeah. if they're a good coach, but it doesn't like you can't put that ahead of the integrity of the federation. Yeah. I mean, I, I look at it from other sports perspectives. Uh, we'll wrap up this point shortly. You wouldn't see, or you you wouldn't see. A, a referee coming up in the NRL where his entire fanhood, his entire childhood, he's talking about being a lover of the Broncos and like, you know, obsessed with the Broncos and it's all over his Instagram and social media. Then he ends up in the, on the field refereeing the Broncos. And there's some blatantly obvious calls going the way of the Broncos and favoring the Broncos. And then all of a sudden starts to come the questions that everyone usually has about the team that seems to get the, the rub of the ball. Yeah. It just, you'd start to take that away from the perception. You're like, well, if we if we just don't have coach, uh, re, re, you know, everyone's gonna have a team they support, but we take that bias away from the person being just blatantly outspoken about it, or you know, being in the limelight that way, you remove that potential issue because everyone's gonna have a, everyone will have a rugby league team they, they they're a supporter of. But I mean, if you've got someone who's got family members or friends or something like that that are in the Broncos, you're not gonna go, hey, you're a referee for this game. Yeah, yeah, it's just not like not gonna happen. Yeah. Okay. I mean, moving on to the, uh, I guess the the last, well, another elephant in the room is some big things that have recently come out as transpiring in a a certain federation. I don't even know how we attack this without. I also want to attack it from the the disgust, the the invasion of privacy, the maltreatment, the. I don't even know. I don't even know the word to describe it, but it's not good. Yeah. So yeah, without you know slandering or mentioning specifically who it is, though the sort of things that are being spoken about, you know, not having a set judging criteria, coaches on the judging panel, being forced to use X tan and X hair and makeup, but charged an absolutely exorbitant amount for it. They're all the things that we've set up from the start to wipe out. Like, mm -hmm. I totally understand a business decision of your business, you want all your clients to use X Tanner. But if you're doing that, it should be, if it's forced and you have to do it, it should be at a discount, not a premium. Yeah. And it should also not affect your placing if... Yeah if you choose not to. So, yeah. yeah, NBA, we have, every show has a preferred tan and hair and makeup sponsor. Mm -hmm. so 
but I don't get a list and go, oh, that person's not placing because they didn't use them. Yeah. That person's, you know, and that part of the agreement with these providers is that they are providing the service at a fair market value. Just because yep. they're the preferred one doesn't mean they can charge extra. Their yep. advantage is they're the preferred one, so they're going to get more. They're the only ones backstage. Yep. So that's a great competitive advantage. Yeah, exactly. They need to charge more as well. Yeah, it's like telling Maccas you're the only ones that are allowed on the highway, but also Maccas tries to charge a higher price. Yeah, yeah. Like it's, yeah, that's where the like it's it's pure extortion you know? yeah so, yeah yeah and and i i don't understand that level of you know forced loyalty forced anything you know competitors are our customers yeah we can't force them to do anything at all you know as far as tan, hair, makeup, who they get their photos with, yeah. what they do the day before the show, what they do after the show, what other federations they compete in. Like, yeah. Why, you know, why would you care about that, you know, unless you have, you know, something to hide that you don't want them to go and see other federations that are better, Yeah. You know? You're forcing people to stay in your federation. It's probably for that reason. You don't want to see them to see other places that are better. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we've we've just had a recent um, a recent barrage of a certain federation stepping uh, oh athletes of a certain federation stepping down due to some uh, unprofessional. Uh, Disc discord? No, no, I wouldn't say discourse. I'm gonna say acts. We're gonna say uh professional engagements, unprofessional engagements. Yeah. The the oh man, I, I don't I don't even know how to attack this because it was so shocking when I saw it. But to see the fact that people that I know who are very, 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 very loyal to this federation denounce pro statuses and pro cards and separate entirely even just in the Australian branch or the Australian brand, whoever you want to do it like yeah. that, that is going to tarnish bodybuilding to sports. Like yeah. it, it's the stuff that we get most worried about with people being like, you know, it's creepy. It's, you know, all those things that are, that you know, coaches are doing or whatever. And we try, you know, we try to be good ethical people that don't allow that to happen. So we can, you know, prevent that reputation. But when people in these federations, are caught doing that stuff and you've got your blatant pros now saying like, I stand with XYZ people, we're out, we're not coming back, this is disgusting. Like that's the stuff we have to correct and run good coaching and good organizations and good federations to kind of offset that shouldn't even be happening. Yeah. And yeah, I hope that from this one, that federation does actually just take it on board and fix all those things. Yeah. Or if they don't, they do actually start slipping into the... Uh, yeah. yeah but yeah continue i was just i was just wanted to make sure we're on the same page <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah if if that sort of stuff continues that federation yeah should should be gone forever like yeah so I, mean, I'm not, like, hey. I, I i don't even want to make statements because i don't want to get caught out anywhere not that you know this podcast has that sort of reach but like there's bound to be some legality issues. There's bound to be like if I was if I was the people involved, like I don't know, I'd I'd draw some hard lines if I was some of the people that were that you know went through certain things that were engaged in those federations. I'd I'd be pretty pissed. Yeah, but it just comes back to the morals of those people that are in leadership positions in that yeah. federation, and you know where their morals stand, and you know they they need a check of their morals and and to stop doing those things yeah i mean yeah like i said you know it's it's just it's hard when people already have perceptions and taboo opinions of what we do and how we do it and what it what involves so anytime like anytime you're an outlier of something and people can sink their claws into you further to make it harder like they'll generally do it so when people already have these negative opinions of us and then things like this happen. Well, now they're just like, see, you proved my point. It's like, well, 
Now we've got to come back and be even better coaches, even better federations, even better athletes to show people that that's not what it is. And obviously there's just, you know, shitty, there's just shit amongst the good. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I hope the, uh, the good that comes from it is the federations. You know, and I'm not the only federation that, you know, highlights all the good things. There are other federations that yeah. run shows well, but those federations get actually put on a pedestal and, yeah. and you know, rewarded for having morals, doing everything right. Yeah. Because, you know, these, these federations that aren't doing it right keep growing, people keep going back. Yeah. Because they're the cool federation, you know, and nothing changes. You're essentially saying it's okay to do those things i don't mind if you keep going back yeah what's that what's that expression the um the the standard you walk by is a standard you accept that's it yeah i mean yeah i I know i'll be reluctant to take my females through that federation or at least encourage them to do so if they come to me wanting to i will discuss it with them but like i'd be hard pressed saying like where we stand on that, you should go do it. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm not that I'm someone with 10,000 clients. I'm going to make a big impact or a big difference, but at the same time, like whether it's one or two, that's now something that I'll have to think about for their safety. Yeah. But if every coach with one or two clients does that, you know, there's a hundred coaches out there that don't have two clients in the show now. Yeah. That makes a big difference. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But when, yeah, when people forget about it in three weeks' time and then still go and do the show, then nothing changes. Yeah. I mean, yeah, just for the the protection of guys or girls, like, you know, that you're in very vulnerable spots, you're in very dangerous spots with what we do, what we wear, what we say, how we, how we look, how we present ourselves, content that's required, you know, things we do to get that next level of reach and stuff like that. So... You know, you want, you would hope people are conscious of that and want to protect that for their athlete's sake, or at least for even their personal sake. I just, I just can't see it as something that should go on in the future. But you know, that's my opinion here or there, and probably not worth much. And I don't know, but yeah, just to me, it's it's something that when I heard it, I was I was actually pretty fucking gobsmacked that that was something that was happening. Like, yeah. you know, you, you hear the stories and the fables of like the creepy coach here or there, or like the, the creepy athlete here or there or something like that. And it's like, you know, you know, you, you got people that are pent up on hormones and they're tired and emotional and dependent. So it's, you know, these things can happen. Lines are blurred, but then there's just blatantly bad stuff. Yeah. That's it. And yeah, potentially illegal. <laughs> yeah. 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 Let's yeah. be clear. It pretty much is. Yeah. yeah. Though, you know, we're in a sport that turns a blind eye to other illegal things in <laughs> yeah. some federations. I mean, yeah, yeah. So, pot, pot really yeah. kettle black there, I guess, in that yeah. context, but I suppose it's the context of that yeah. action that matters more. Yeah. So, but yeah, you know, hopefully that that side of things needs to just complete, completely be wiped. You know? And yep. yeah, forcing people to do things to get a better placing needs to stop no matter what those things are. 100%. 100% agree. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. But yeah, mate, give us a quick rundown. What's the season look like? We're, you know, we've gone on tangent now for an hour. We'll be here for another two hours, really, if we, if we wanted to be. Yeah. Yeah. What's, uh, what's the plans for this season? We've got season B now, as you said, 10 days away. How long does the season run for? Where's your show? It's nationals this year. So yeah, first show in 10 days or, a lot less by the time people actually hear this yeah. is our South Coast Spectacular. So in Wollongong, which is in yeah, 10 days from today, which date I'm just pulling up in front of me because, yeah, great memory and all. <laughs> yeah. The, no. uh, 11th of September. Yeah, 11th of September. Then two weeks after that, we've got our New South Wales state titles. Mm-hmm. So that... Um, yeah, that's a base town sports in New South Wales. Weekend after that is our Queensland state titles, which is the 30th of September. Yep. Then weekend after that, I'm down in Tasmania for the Tasmania state titles. And then we nationals yep. on the 14th? Yep, 14th and 15th of yeah. October in Melbourne. Nice. Yep. That's a... 
Yeah. Hell of a six weeks for you. Yeah. So no, it's uh, yeah. Head down, bum up for the next yeah, <laughs> yeah, next weeks. So yeah. I guess I guess to wrap it up, like how, what what is the po- like you know we know what post show feels and looks like for an athlete and a coach. You know, we're assessing the judges. We're asking the judges for feedback. I'm getting my clients head down. I'm getting them back into what they need to do, having a health phase, getting like mentally better again, probably getting back to life. What is a post show for a a founder, a president, a, a promoter? Like what does post season look like? Is a quick, I guess, nutshell. Is it straight yeah. back to work plan the next season? Is it making sure that everything's like getting feedback straight away? Yep. Feedback straight away or as quick as possible is definitely one of the important ones. Yep. Um, yeah, people want to know how well they did. Some feedback I can take, you know, a bit of time to get to as well. So mm-hmm. yeah, even feedback straight away isn't isn't easy to do. Yeah. Yeah. Throughout I mean, the season, if someone wants to go to nationals, I'll give them feedback as quick as possible. Yeah. You know, if someone wants feedback of what to do in the off season. I can take a bit of time to oh, give yeah, that yeah, to for because, sure. Yeah, you know, most people are nowadays taking eighteen months between shows, so they should. You know, they're they're taking that more time, so I'm taking that bit more time to give them actual, true, constructive feedback. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and even it's not really straight on to the next season because I've basically already got all of next season planned now. Yeah. You know, it's the season after that that I start planning. So yeah. as soon as season B this year finishes, you're planning season B. Season, planning season B twenty twenty four. Like season season A twenty three or twenty four is mostly planned. There's you know some some things that I'm juggling around that, but yeah, you know a large part of the venue booking those sort of things has been done. Yeah, you know, so yeah, I've got posters to get out, yeah. you know, all the marketing material to, to make happen. Mm-hmm. You know, all that's within that first couple of weeks post-show. You know, it's also, you know, going through judges' feedback for them, you know, training if a judge needs training. You know, yeah, all of course. Things as well. They're, they're more things I'm looking at. Mm-hmm. You know, plus also definitely is some time to recharge. Like, <laughs> the post comp low just as bad as any competitor it's, so, it's, yeah. it's yeah. just like as someone who's very uh introverted and someone who's very like i'm a, I'm, I'm a hermit the yeah. the the pain of dealing with 150 high neurotic at the time we'll say neurotic but very goal driven emotionally charged tired fatigued exhausted athletes across yeah how many shows across a season dealing with that is exhaustion in and of itself. That is warranting a fucking off season. Yeah. It's, it's so much fun at the time, but it was also, you know, just as big a high and just as big a low afterwards. For sure. As if I'd done a prep myself. I even get comp brain. Like I start (laughs) forgetting things two, three weeks out from comp, even though I'm not 2% body fat. Yeah. It happens. Guys, just, just do this. Yeah, so I yeah, appreciate that. It, it, it's so similar, and and that's where I think you know promoting, if having competed, is a lot better. Yeah, you know, to try and promote this sport having not done it. Yeah, like the experience is so similar across you know running the show and actually being in. Yeah, uh, I I don't get why anyone would want to promote a show that didn't love the sport from yeah, having been yeah. involved themselves at some stage. 100%. Makes yeah. most sense to me. Yeah. But I guess to finish off, given the season is right around the corner, what's one piece of advice you have for every athlete that's going to hear this between now and nationals? Um, so the biggest one, um, keep your bum down, work your ass off, keep working, um, trust your coach. The, there's two. Um, yeah, that's probably it. Appreciate that. Can't yeah. argue. That's good advice. Yeah. Listen to your coach and keep fucking working. Yeah. All right, mate. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for stopping with us and uh, and chatting shop and chatting chatting bodybuilding. Yep. No worries. Anytime. Um, is there any any links we need to know about or to find, or we just go into the NBA website and we can just direct people there for tickets and shows and 
Yep. So best place to find anything is actually our socials. Socials yep. get updated a lot quicker than websites nowadays. So the web, the Instagram is NBA Australia underscore official. So had to separate it from that bus basketball thing. <laughs> so yeah, NBA Australia underscore official. Um, my own in Instagram is S T U E Y triple O. Um, yeah, I, you can hit me up for any questions as well. Um, yeah, either of those or the website, which is naturalbodybuildingaustralia.org. Awesome. We'll have those links in the uh, description for everyone to click and follow and get involved with. Thanks again, mate. I appreciate your time. No worries.